an initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership formed in 2007, the Business Innovation Zone, the Biz, exists to connect entrepreneurial needs with qualified resources and to provide guided professional and business direction. The Biz helps entrepreneurs maximize their successes by helping them navigate resources, strengthen knowledge, improve skills, form strategic alliances, and secure proper capitalization. To find out more about The Biz, visit www.bizci.org. All right, thanks, Mike. I think I know everybody in here today, pretty much. Some of you I know. So I will do the, the basic introduction, making sure the mics are good. So, uh, this presentation wasn't originally going to be the F word, but because of the headlines and other things, it sort of informed organically what I was going to talk about. So, I'm going to give a little background about myself and also the team and the product that we built and sort of the situation that we went through during 2012 and the decisions that we made and then an update of where we are in 2013. That's uh, informative as well. And then uh, just kind of conclude with a few lessons, not only from the business and for you as entrepreneurs, but I think life lessons that are important not only for our, our business community here, but probably for our families and our society as a whole. So yeah, this sounds like a big lunch of it's actually not. So that's me. I'm the president and CEO and co-founder along with Richard Kersner of Portion Mobile, which was started in 2010. Order over a different building. A little bit about me. I was born and grew up in Wisconsin, went to the University of Wisconsin, and got a bachelor's in anthropology. I was actually an archaeologist. And I spent uh, almost a year, two separate times, living with hunter gatherers in Africa. So, Bushman, there's one of my Bushman friends right there, who faces adversity every single day. It's not going to the grocery store to pick up any. It's hunting down a giraffe to feed the community food or going hungry. Uh, after a stint with uh, Priceline founder, before he started Priceline, where I learned what a real entrepreneur looks like and behaves, which was crazy, but it's a hell of a lesson. I then came and joined CD Software, which was a West Des Moines uh, email and productivity company. Uh, it was traded on NASDAQ and actually was the president of that company. Until 2000, when I joined uh, with Richard to form our first company, KG Internet. And we did a lot of web development work uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, Kinsey Manufacturing, Premier Agricultural, and others. But probably the one that you may know is the Beacom Classic Auction Company. And some of that work still remains today accessible on the internet. And then, uh, as I mentioned, in 2010, we formed Fortune Mobile. The main reason that we or Fortune Mobile, and I think this informs much of what you're going to hear today, is that we saw the forthcoming wave of the smartphone mobile revolution. And if you're not keeping up on statistics, probably everybody you know has a smartphone. Well, it's now the case that 58% of American mobile subscribers have a smartphone. When we started this, it was 33%. So we were, our belief was no matter what we do, we need to be in this market doing something so that we can learn and find opportunities. And, and we are, we did, and so that's a lot of what we'll talk about today. Now while I'm the one giving the presentation, this is really a story about our team. There are six of us, three of them are here, we're with our CMOs back here to join us. And then the bulk of our team is either here or out, outside of uh, outside of the state. We practice a virtual company model in that we are able to go where the talent is. As many of you know, right now there's a lot of talent shortages in the technical area. We think that ability to operate, and that's the way that I've been operating companies for the past 15 years, gives us a competitive advantage versus companies that insist on employees being co-located. Right? So the F word. All right. In the context of the society that we're in, the community that we're in, the part of the country that we're in, failure is what I would consider to be that unspoken word. Uh, relatives, family members, they all commented on various headlines that had the word failure. And so we're still in business, aren't you? And the answer is absolutely. 
probably stronger now than we have ever been before. But it's one of those things that people have difficulty talking about. It's the same thing as if a, if a death in the family occurs or some other deeply personal issue. And as Mike said, a lot of popular culture misunderstands what it means to be an entrepreneur, what it means to be an inventor, what it means to run a business. My father has often told me that if you're not failing, if you're not making mistakes, that means you're not striving hard enough. That, that's something I, I kept with me uh, my whole life. So if we want to talk about what failure is, it's really just failure is not reaching a particular state or objective, right? So when we talk about this in the context of a startup, we have investors, and we have goals, and we want to reach those goals. And many times they're monetary or their number of users, or there's some other metric that we put together. And as, and as many of you know, and as Colwell will tell you, oftentimes we see business plans where the expense side of the equation is very well known, because that's something that we can really understand and get our hands around. We can Google search and see how much our Amazon Web Services are going to cost. But the whole objective of how much money we might make or how quickly revenue might ramp up oftentimes is wrong, wrong by orders of magnitude, simply because there are so many factors that go into that. And so what we're going to talk about today is not failure of individuals, or failure of the company, we're going to talk about how a business model that had a whole organization behind it didn't reach its objectives. That's really what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to talk about how we as an organization recognized that and made decisions and then acted with speed to implement those decisions. So it's a loaded word, as I mentioned. And there's this whole thing that we call Iowa Nice. I remember during the campaign, uh, the gentleman made the video, which was pretty good. But I have to tell you, it's one of those things that does actually exist. And in fact, it's more of a, it's more of a regional thing. And what it is, is that people feel inhibited from telling you if you're doing something that they don't want, or that they're not willing to invest in or that they're not willing to uh, talk to you about in terms that they're afraid might be offensive or make, make them seem like they're uh, not nice people. I'm going to try to refrain from using profanity here since we're taking it. It's not a wall across the page. But there are no beliefs being inserted. So. Right, exactly. So, uh, and, and that manifests itself in many ways. I mean, in many ways, that's sort of the glue of our society, which makes living in the Midwest free. You know, you're on the inter uh, interstate, and you need to get on, someone will actually slow down and let you in. As you know, in New York, that ain't happening. So part of that is a very positive thing, I think, about our society. But as an entrepreneur, it's an important thing to realize that exists. So both in the context of having this honest and frank, transparent discussion about our business model, and as well as getting feedback, the Midwestern Nice, I think, has, has a place, right? So what is Mojava? Mojava is the product that sort of is the, is the main character of the story. And, and basically, Mojava is a software as a service originally designed for, for agencies and creative people rapidly create mobile optimized websites that look and function beautifully on smartphones, right? And the, you know, one of the things that drove that was, and it's still the fact, that over 75% of the websites that you'll visit today, on any random day in your travel or something like that, do not present a mobile optimized view. Either you have attention zoom or some of the functions aren't working properly, and so our system was designed to overcome that with no program. And so the business model was essentially around agencies. We called it the agency model. And it wasn't something that we just immediately came to. Uh, we originally had started Mojava thinking it would be a tool that small business would use to solve various problems. And as we looked at the implications of that, as we talked to people who advised us, did have advice and people participating. We, we moved to an agency model, but the 
notion here, I think there's actually a pointer, isn't there on this thing? Paul, that, that, that what we would be able to do is, oh, by the way, okay, never mind. Um, that what we would be able to do is work through an agency. An agency would have multiple customers. And eventually, we would have all these agencies, and they would have customers, and they'd be building Mojava sites using Mojava as a toolkit, much as they would use the Adobe product. So we would be a tool provider to those agencies. So why the agency model? Well, at the time, we thought the following things were true, that it would differentiate ourselves from other competitors in the market. Many of them were, were focused on the consumer side and basically trying to automatically convert an existing website into something mobile with greater or lesser degrees of success. We didn't want to do that because we thought that gave suboptimal results that, that someone that was truly interested in their brand and being effective wouldn't be happy with. So we geared our tool towards the design professional. Less expensive to support. If you go back to that previous slide, the notion was that in training the agency, someone that, is, that knows what a web browser is, knows what a JPEG file is, knows how to upload files to the internet, and believe me, there are many people that don't know those things, that by training them, they would then use the tool to support their customers and we would be supporting more professionally oriented people so we wouldn't be answering questions about how to turn the computer on. And this is informed from my background in working with CD software, where I once had a support staff of, I think it was 25, and many times we were answering basic questions like that for email. So, been in the trenches on that. Faster to market. It is the case that if you're building a tool for a certain set of professionals and you've got it really well defined, it is easier to move forward more quickly. If you have to put in a lot of niceties and fail safes and things like that for the non technical user or the non professional user, then you significantly extend your development process. And what that means for entrepreneurs, it means more money or more people, but most important, more time. Because time is the one thing that is the most valuable. And finally, our model. Uh, with the way that we were doing it through the agencies, we wouldn't have the collection issues directly with small businesses and all of that. We thought that the network effect of the renewal, renewals, particularly in year two, and it might help us with our business plan if you look at year two, wonderful things began to happen in year two as sites automatically renewed and as the growth rate of new sites continued because those renewal dollars didn't have a lot of associated support or marketing. So all look good on paper, look good enough that the state gave us $50,000, look good enough that we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital, and off we went. The value proposition for agencies was that a job was fast. How fast is it? You can create a very, very complex and sophisticated site in less than two hours. <coughs> Typically, agencies have the logos and the colors and all that. And people think, oh, he's talking two hours. I mean two hours. And we'll talk a little bit about what two hours means because we now offer a service related to that. Profitable, what we were trying to show the agencies was that instead of hunting that big elephant, that single elephant customer, that big project with six figures that may or may not go away and all of the impacts if you don't get that, instead go after the gazelles. They're much more plentiful and your odds of getting a set of gazelles is much higher when you're hunting than if you're just out for elephants. And because the way Mojava was created, they didn't need to go to their developers, they could go to designers, they could even go to interns. We've shown that Mojava is so easy to use that even eighth graders have created uh, science fair projects with this tool in the last three months. So it's, it's not a child's tool, but it is very straightforward to use. And the other thing that we wanted to show them was it gave them an opportunity to get more relationship with customers that were repeatable. And once their staff are familiar with how to do a site and the principles and selling it to one set of customers, they can rapidly move through their, their customer book and create these sites. 
and that because of the type of people they were using, the speed and things of that, it was a very profitable model. And there are agencies today that are using this model, and they are making money. So the main thing that we got from that was leverage, right? We weren't having to bear the first year cost of direct marketing and small business owner. Um, we could really submerge the first year uh, profitability in a way that we didn't think was sustainable. So the journey to December 10th. December 10th, 2012 is a very important date in the history of our company because that's when we got together to evaluate where we were. So let's start at the beginning. This is a, a little release timeline. One of the things we do as a company is we try to release a new version of something every two to three weeks. And right here, this proves it. This is the historical chart beginning on February 1st when version one came out. And then all of the versions, even for one in February, each of those wasn't like, you know, word changes or, or little tiny features. Many of them were integrations with things like PayPal, Walla, Wufu, Constant Contact, Single Platform, uh, and on and on and on. Because one of the other things we try to do with the network effect is not just work with agencies, but work with bigger technology providers on the web, bring our product into their sphere of influence, and have them talk about us as someone that can solve problems on mobile. Because many of those companies I just mentioned had no mobile-based solution. So through 16 releases, we were we were knocking it out of the park technically. Um, handling bugs, putting in new features. Uh, I think people that are familiar with our release history um, know the level of quality and the velocity we have. So that part is going really well. So our plan to, to our plan then meets the market, right? Our thought was that we would start with a core group of agencies that participated during a beta testing program. And we actually worked with Drew McClellan, many of you know, to um, introduce us to this core group of agencies who vetted much of the business plan, right? Talked to us about that, made sense to them. Uh, some of them participated in the actual technical beta, some of them did not. Tons of pitches, right? Tons of pitches to agencies. A variety of different types of marketing. Online marketing, uh, affiliate marketing through these companies I mentioned earlier, uh, personal appearances, makes it sound like a celebrity, but like going to a, um, in May of that year, we went to uh, a gathering of influential bloggers and uh, supported an event there and spoke at the event, gave an opportunity to network with everyone face to face, give the pitch, not once but twice. Later in the summer, went to a uh, agency only thing in Phoenix where I wore this black shirt along the brook in a courtyard at noon in the sun and, and pitched 300 people in groups of 10. Uh, I, I was a limp rag after that. It was, it was the worst idea I had ever seen in my life. But there we were in black, you know, in noon. Uh, and then throughout the course of that two-day event, talked to every agency owner, agency leader, designer that was there, not once, not twice, not three times, probably four times, because we also introduced the keynote speaker when we got the pitch to Bob. Um, and what happened was we saw uneven adoption. Even amongst that core group that had said, this is a great idea, I'll sign right up, there was always a reason why something wasn't happening. But yet there were other agencies that, you know, just like from that uh, Charlie Sheen movie, they got all of their customers into Mojave, right? They got them all into Blue Star Airlines. It was great. It was fabulous. Um, and and those are those are core customers today that we learned a lot from. They, uh, you know, they were coming in buying the product for the three hundred dollar year subscription, and they were turning around and selling it fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars. Thank you very much, Mr. Gurney and Mr. Kirchner. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I've got an intern from the summer in here building these things. This is super, and they still love it. So December tenth, as, as Dick will tell you, the numbers don't lie. The, the revenue numbers and the adoption numbers are not meeting what we wanted to do. And because we're virtual, we bring everybody together about once a quarter or 
three times a year. So December 10th, we had a meeting with the team and um, we went over um, where we were. And based, and you know, you always make decisions based on the information you have, right? There's never a perfect set of information. If you wait for a perfect set of information, then you're never making a decision. It's always being deferred. You're always waiting for clarity to come. You're always waiting for the whole story. I think we you know, know where those sorts of terms come from. We hear them frequently from a place out east. Um, but basically, you take what you have and you make, you make some conclusions. What we determined was that not only on the basis of interacting with agencies, but some people that advise, target, and others, we got the feedback that we were solving a problem agencies didn't have. It's not that they didn't believe in mold. It's not that they were unsure about what to do with mold. What they wanted to do, what we didn't really grasp, was they wanted big projects with lots of little dollars. And we weren't providing a solution that would And we're not really sure, even to this day, why that early core group didn't, wasn't honest with this, with us about that. Maybe they're not even honest with themselves. You know, I, I don't. Know. And I'm not. And, and, and I'll talk about this later. I am not saying that other people are responsible. We made the decision to do the agency model. We didn't question the feedback we were getting. We went 110 percent into it. We are responsible. For Results, right? But they prefer fewer, larger projects to more smaller projects. Certain agencies. Some of the ones that are, that are not going to end with no job, they're, they typically are a younger group. They're, they're more tied in to um, newer trends, and they're looking for any tool to give them a leg up on the legacy agencies within their, within their region. So as part of that December 10th meeting, of all six of us, we talked about and we asked the questions about what is working, what is not working, what's to change, and what's next. I think those are important questions. And you can't just you know, sort of talk about it esoterically. You really, I mean, we had some brutally frank conversations. And it's not one of the high points of your day to have these. But as an entrepreneur, you've got to engage in this sort of creative self-destruction because if you don't do it, market forces will. So what did we come up with? We came up with a couple of different things. I'm going to kind of carry these differently. This may look like more of the same, but only different names. It's not actually. Um, what we did is by listening very carefully to agencies with success, there were things they were telling us that we didn't really hear properly early on. And one of those is some agencies understand that mobile is an entirely different construct, and they can also deliver different information about consumer patterns of use than you can for desktop or laptop or even um, iPad. And what I mean by that is a Mojava site can ask the consumer where they are. And if the consumer is trying to leverage location information, like where is the closest store to where I am or how do I get to your location for my meeting, they'll share that. 65% of the time they'll share that based on our statistical averages. And once they share that, then we know where their location is in space, and then we know everything that they did with that Mojava site, that what we call behavior stream, is now part of that location. So if you begin to think about that, unlike saying, oh, we had visitors from Des Moines, or we had visitors from West Des Moines, when you look at Google Analytics, you now know I have people at this street corner that were doing the following things. Were they looking for addresses? Were they calling? And we have we have an agency as a client, they have uh, payday loan services. Okay, not the most glamorous business. But they have, you know, 700 locations across the United States working with different brands. They use Mojava to get people to the payday loan places for each of the different brands. It's, it's a 
important for people to, because not all locations have the same open hours and there's a density thing. But we showed them by using our analytics that's built into the product, how they can see where people are using things during the day and which locations are calling through graphical displays. I didn't, I didn't want to go into a feature thing here. That was really useful to them because how did they use that? It was yet another piece of information to help them determine where the next location so we broke apart the analytical portion of Mojava into Mojava Analytics. And then the other thing we learned from that same type of customer, but across many different agencies, was that managing location information, if you have dealers, or if you're selling products in what's called depot, or a variety of other things like that, managing that information in the desktop context and in the mobile context is difficult. Because in the desktop context, users might want to search on the basis of zip code. But in the mobile context, that's got no meaning. I, I actually don't know if, what zip code I'm in right here. I might guess that I'm at 50309. But since my phone can share my location, why not use that instead? So we, we listened carefully, and we did some checking, and we found out that that was actually a problem. So people were having to go to two or three different systems to manage that location information for viewer networks. So we've got today, if you went to our website, you'll see displayed across the home page three different products. Builder, which is exactly the same product that we call the Java, no difference. Um, there is now a beta program for the analytics. And the main thing here from a business perspective is instead of analytics just being tied to our own product, it's now tied to a wide range of products. So if you're a WordPress user or Joomla or Drupal or anything else, you can use geolocation for reporting. And uh, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. And then uh, this is a, a future thing. The work actually hasn't been done yet, but all of the, the features and the planning and the segmenting of the code has been done. And one of the great things with our team is that because they use really modern techniques in building our software, it's actually comparatively straightforward to take these large chunks of functionality and move them into fresh products. The other aspect of this is that's all great, but what do you do when you've exhausted your, your startup capital, right? We haven't exhausted it to the point where we can't pay people, but it was unsustainable in the run rate. But we had a really good core team. We only have three developers. Um, as the CFO or CT, CTO for the Wallace said, your team's done really well to do all this work in such a short time with three people. Three guys. And so what's really interesting about them as a cohesive team is one of the best I've ever seen. Um, the only team I've seen that might have been more productive is some Russians that we hired the CD um, who were fleeing the, the oppression. Soviet Union had a special reason. Those guys, they, they never went home. They smoked on filtered cigarettes and they worked like crazy people. So they were so glad to see that they could buy fresh bananas. <laughs> the story is honest to God's story. Uh, one of them had never had bananas in his entire life. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, a lot of times it means being practical. I mean, there's a pride with being a tool development company, and we do things this way, and this is our product line and all that. Well, if it's not paying the bills, pride goes before the fall or so of the time, right? So being practical guys, we said, how can we keep together? And the answer was, there were people that we had relationships with that desperately needed the sort of help that our technical team could give. So right now, our technical team is about 80 to 90 percent providing contracting services to this customer. They have a massive project that they're successful. It's going to lead to all these other things being dragged up. But in the meantime, we're paying our team. They're happy with the work, um, and, and off we go. And that—that's one example of what we have to do as an entrepreneur: is that the path forward may not always be the path that you set a year ago, right? It may not be the path that you're going to go out and advertise. Oh, yeah, I'm not ready now. Well, we know an awful lot about mobile, so these guys have found our mobile expertise to be very valuable, and they're willing to pay for it. And that's helped us keep our team 
which is very important. Did all of this possible? Well, Java hasn't stopped. Um, the phone is ringing each and every day. And what's, what's sort of happening is that, uh, well, we'll go into that a little bit more. But things have changed, even from a year. Whereas before we had to educate people about what mobile is and how smartphones were important, we don't have to do that that much anymore. It's very rare. Really, it comes down to decision about should I do your stuff or should I do the native app? Engage people in conversation. Budgets, timelines, costs, things like that. So what we're doing is we're sectioning out small things that we put into each of our three periods to add to our job. We just recently did that with some changes um, to help better blog posts and also change the way that our, our mappings work because Lo and behold, a couple weeks ago, or actually it's a month ago, a very large international aid firm, not based in Iowa, called us and needed to have a viewer locator for North America and Canada, and they needed it immediately. Not next week, not next month, a couple days. Couldn't we do it? And it was, it was a piece of cake. The, the big issue became there's so many, there's 966 of these viewers. We never had one viewer locator that had that many in one application. So we had to make some changes. We made the changes, put it out, they won. They won. Um, I think what this all says is that staying in the game. If you recall, I said the reason we started Torsion was that we saw a global revolution, a global revolution, right? There are still over a billion people that are going to have access to some sort of smartphone in the next three to five years, a billion. Now that growth isn't happening here in the United States. It's not even happening in Europe. It's happening elsewhere. And this enters into a whole discussion about who is a manufacturer, has the right phone and all that. You know what, we don't actually care. As long as there is a web browser on those phones and they have a connection to the internet, which they will, there's an opportunity because the lowest common denominator once you get about text messaging is the mobile phone. It works across all devices. And so by being vital in maintaining our ability to produce something interesting and being able to move much out forward, we think we'll have an opportunity. It may, it may be like LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn was around for I don't know how many years, 14 years before they went public. Sometimes things take longer than you and you know, like if you've pitched to investors, they want the, the, unless they're extremely knowledgeable and experienced, they want to see the year two or three plan. They're not interested in the year four. So, what are their early results? Oh, I guess I forgot one thing. We're selling Mojava sites directly to small business. I guess that was the first thing. Actually, that's the most important. It might shock you to learn, but what we've, what we've put forward is a $500 package. And the promise is this, doesn't matter who you are, what kind of business, we'll produce a Mojava site ready to go for you within 48 hours for $500. And we're able to do that because it takes us two hours or less. We don't have to have any of the developers involved. It's either Richard, myself, or a third person that's doing the work. And uh, Richard is a as an art background, but I don't think he would consider himself to be a day in and day out designer, but he's doing fabulous stuff. And you know who we're doing work for? Here is the irony, we're doing work for agencies. We just did a big project for an agency out in New York City yesterday for a big, uh, what, what the hell is that thing called? Chelsea Piers? Yeah, it's like this multi uh, facility thing, the racket club, tennis, golf, they think of golf. They're calling us. And why are they calling us? Because they don't have the staff available to do this, but they, they see these opportunities now moving to other other agencies. They don't wanna they don't want to lose the relationship. They don't want to lose the desktop business just because they can't do the mobile. And small businesses are tired of getting five thousand dollar proposals from traditional web firms and say, oh, we're gonna take your desktop website and we're gonna completely redesign it and make it responsive and it will be beautiful and add tablets and smartphones, all these other things. And that's the way of the future, and that's the only one way to do it. 
et cetera, et cetera. Well, my response to that is there never has been and never will be one way to do something on the internet. Because if that was true, we'd all still be using AOL today. <laughs> and so, you know, businesses, they know time is valuable. That's a big chunk of change. Some of the proposals we've seen have been $15,000. And they may do very wonderful work. But many times there's so many dependencies. Well, I got to change the CMS to WordPress, and then I have to train someone, and then I have to have this contact, and then there's the testing and all of this, where they can have something that their consumer can use and access to find out where they are and get to their place on the smartphone and the way the consumer wants to do it in 48 hours. To them, that's a better value proposition. So we're seeing a lot of that type of interaction. It presents challenges as well, but the interesting thing is money's coming in the door, right? And I don't think, as my dad always said, you got to put the money in the bank. It's like, it's like Father's Day here today, right? Mm -hmm. Things my dad presented, right? So what are the early results? Okay, so as much as we'd like to be transparent, we're not here to tell you, you know, how much money we made or lost or whatever. Okay, that's not, not the purpose. But this is just the monthly revenue. Yes, July, nothing happened. We're not really sure why that is, but nothing happened. Uh, this was a nice bump because of the Rufu uh, web forms. Those guys have been really supportive. Uh, but anyways, so there, there we are. And so, you know, here's December 10, and, and, then, and then we change things, right? We change. All right, so look what's happening now. Look what's happening now. Now, is this really a hockey stick? I don't know. Come and talk to us again in 30 days. Uh, but from all indications, it looks like we're on we're on to something, right? So basically, uh, January to April of this year, we've had more revenue than all of 2012. We think that's due to the change in our selling model, our business model. But the story is unfinished. Frankly, it will be three years to come. The story is a never ending story. Because uh, why is it unfinished? Well, first of all, all right, all the things that you thought your business model was going to help you avoid, you're now doing. You're supporting. We aren't really supporting customers directly. That's the interesting thing. They, they want the expert to do it for them and deliver it. They don't want to use the tool. That's what we're finding. We put it in their accounts and have access to the statistics. And if they should want to do things on their own or have somebody else do it, it's there for them. But honestly, what they want is not control. They just want the damn thing done. So we're learning something about the service industry, which is I think people are dealing with the complexity of their lives and social networking and all that. They want experts to do stuff. So there's value. How do we reach more people? That's the challenge, right? There's a variety of ways we can do that. We need to see the revenue come in. We need to accumulate the capital and do smart marketing to expand. How do we scale? How do we scale? Is Dick going to just stay up 24 hours a day, 25 hours a day, and then how he builds? <laughs> and, and do this? No. But one of the great things is we don't have to teach somebody how to use Dreamweaver or Coda or any other tool. We already have a tool that requires no coding that we know eighth graders can use to create beautiful content. Now I have to really know is to use a web browser. So we've got something that a lot of other people don't have. So we have a technical and production competitive advantage. I think the marketing problem is bigger. How do we do that? How do we extend the product? Are we charging too little at 500? What's the price sensitivity of the customers we have, the agencies we have? We don't know. Those are some of the, the unfinished things. Our developers, how do they feel? You know, one of the things that we do, and you might say, well, why didn't they go get other jobs or other jobs? Or it's not through any particular loyalty item. It's because we offer something a lot of other places they've been don't offer. These aren't guys right out of college. They're in their late 20s and early 30s, but we're like the second or third place they work. Some of them work at really crappy places. What we do is we say, here are the goals that we have. You can work from home, you 
can work from the office, you can work from the bistro, the cafe, we don't care. Get the goals. We don't have set sick day days, we don't have sick leave days, we don't have any of that stuff. It's basically tell us when you're not going to be there. We're very flexible, we're very respecting of the individual and their needs, and at the same time we have pretty high expectations. Uh, we also enable the technical team basically the way we handle things is we share with them what we need to have done and how it's accomplished is up to them. So they're using a lot of ultra-modern processes. We're all in the cloud, we're using build environments, we use agile development practices, all of these things that other people read about, take to their boss, and they're like, no, we can't do that right now. They, we just say, do it. And so I think part of it is just the culture that we have um, you know, and enabling people to really test the boundaries and do new stuff, fresh stuff, all across the board. At least I hope that's what it is. If they were here, they might do something different. Like maybe Taco Thursday for the which, which we don't have. So, okay, lessons. Going back to the Midwestern nights, one of the things I wish for is that I had either the foresight or the wherewithal or the ability or the contacts to go to the coast and make the pitches and get the feedback, right? Which at a large agency would have been, that's great, but you're not solving a problem we care about because we're interested in high living costs for our premium services. That's how we make money, asshole. So that would have been great to have had that. The other thing that we learned as part of the pivot process is don't discard all customer feedback as like future features that you're never going to do. Because it may turn out that they're really sharing with you, rather than just a nice to have, they might be sharing with you a real pain point. And as Mike will tell you, and, and Brian will tell you, and Paige, and everybody else, you know that if you can solve a pain point for someone, you may have a business. So you need to listen carefully to those things, even if they're not in the lane that you're currently driving. Be ready to change. I think that's been a watchword for my entire life, right? Archaeology, technology, that's fish. There's no interconnection that you can ever fathom. It exists, but I don't want to Change, you have to, not only do you have to be ready to change, but you have to dive in. And the thing about that is, we like to think that all of our decisions are going to come out well. I think statistically, if we can go 50-50 between a good decision and a decision that turned out to be poor, we're actually ahead of the <coughs> Because, again, if you get into the so-called analysis paralysis, people are going to sweep by you, things are going to change, you're going to be left behind. So not only are you ready to change, ready to execute, which means when change is, is required to act decisively, it means reducing the staff, which in our case it didn't, reduce the staff. If it means looking for alternate sources of business, don't look in the mirror and say, oh my god, I've got to change my business model, I told everybody I was in this business, but now I'm going to be doing contracting work. Screw it. What is your objective? My objective is to keep an extremely effective team together and stay in the game. Okay, I'm doing contract. So what? I don't really care what other people think because they don't have a family, they don't have a mortgage, they don't have employees, they have all the other things. They got their own little lives. And I tell you what, that guy in that orange hat over there, I can go and grab that guy, bring him in here, and he can tell us why something isn't going to work. I don't care about that, right? We don't, that's not advice that we care about. There are a lot of people, even maybe some people in the room, that said, you know, I told you, the agency model problems is going to work out. Well, congratulations. What does that mean? We tried it, and now we're sharing our lessons, right? Not everything that goes wrong is your fault. Conversely, that doesn't mean that nothing's your fault. You have to take responsibility. Even if the decisions are made by somebody else, you're in charge, you're the decision maker, you're the co-founder, you have responsibility, right? The flip side is, people that only experience success thinks it's all about them. And I gotta tell you, if that was true, the product that Don Brown invented, Quick Confidence, would be 
the only thing that all of you use instead of instant messaging because that would have dominated the world. It was invented at CD Software in 1988 for local area networks. And there isn't a function that you don't use today on iMessage or iChat or Microsoft Messenger or whatever else that Don didn't already have in that product back in 1988. So there are a lot of things that go together, right? Tipping points, society and culture at large, where the economy is, where people's thinking is, all of these things that you do not have control of. So success is the models you're doing. And then finally, be transparent with the team. There's a lot of organizations that I've interacted with where everything's kept very quiet and things are going great. Oh, everyone's effusive and they're sharing over champagne and beers and the Taco Thursday party and all that. What a wonderful, great place it is to work. Um, and then it turns out that, uh, you know, the commodities trader at Cedar Rapids actually was a house of cards. It's, it requires courage and it requires really a different, more modern mindset, I think, to be transparent with people and share the good with the bad. You know what? Your team members are not stupid. They're as smart as you are. And you can't always anticipate how people are going to react. If you're going to treat them like children, they're going to react like children. So treat them as equal partners, as adults, is my opinion. And you'll, you'll get people more invested in helping make things work and be open-minded to changes that it need to make. The final word. During all this, there was a lot of, there were a lot of bad days, right? You know, where your partner looks at you and say, where the fuck did all the money go? And then you look at salaries, first thing. <laughs> uh, you know, some days where, you know, just things aren't going right, and you're like, God, why did I, how do I get out of this? And I think the key lesson is, each day is a new opportunity to change the world in some way. It may be very small, right? Maybe an act of kindness to a stranger. It may be an encouraging word of a child. It may be helping one of your employees get through or any technical problem. It may be a small sale. But each day is that opportunity. And if you look at it that way, particularly if you're a company leader, I think eventually you will make your own luck and opportunities will come to you. Um, and that may be real easy to say, but I'm now going to be 50 years old next year. Um, I've been working since I was 15 continuously. And I've always found that one of the differences between successful companies and unsuccessful companies in the long run is just the attitude of leadership about how do we how do we get ahead today? How do we make things better today? How do we take advantage of the opportunity that we're vertical, right, today and we're, we're healthy enough to work to make a change? And uh, so that that's the key lesson I, I try to bring to this is that um, we're not we're not dead until we're dead, and even then I don't Sure, that's the case. May not be that. May not be that. That's my uh, that's my presentation. Mr. Wong, you don't have to give me the answers you gave, but what was the most sobering question from an employee during this on the center event, and the most sobering question from a, a comment from a customer? I think from an employee, uh, it was really, you know, at the beginning of it, can we really do anything that would make a difference? But also part of it was when we sat down, you know, you bullet point the options as to what you're going to do. One of the options is the tech, which you didn't look at. Yes. So yeah, the existence of action. So, what the action shows. The uh, probably in terms of the presentations, one that has kind of stuck with me is uh, a uh, it wasn't a customer, but it was actually something I pitched to. Uh, very pleasant, very polite. This was actually one of those moments where I did get down Midwestern. 
back and they said, well, at best, your solution is a bridge between today and tomorrow. And my response was, what's your sense of how, how long the bridge lasts? And they didn't really know, but they, they were, again, they were firmly in the camp of response and design, large project, you know, solves all evils. Um, you know, which is which is a trap we often fall into. It's software developers for new code. Oh yeah, that problem's going to fix that. That problem's going to fix that. Global oh, warning. Oh yeah, we got that covered. And uh, so we have the question. Right. How did uh, an emotion? You guys are business setters in here. Before, but how did your emotional state go through all of this? I mean, you are challenging at multiple people. Um, were you guys able with your experience to remove emotional impact, or do you feel like that impact was that a player? Yeah, it was a roller coaster. I mean, anyone who knows me knows I'm pretty intense. So when I'm having a bad day, unfortunately, you know, not everybody knew it, but and my wife knew it too. I think it's been, probably been harder on her because she she had she was a medical professional, you know. So it's just it's just tough, you know. Where's the next paycheck and then off from that? So all sorts of conversations are tough. Um, at the same step, for me personally, and I've been through enough really tough family situations or business situations where the fear of the unknown really isn't there. Because when you put those options on the board, I know what they all mean now. Whereas when I was 27, I didn't know what it meant. You know, if I was part of a company and went out of business, is my career done? Am I dead? Am I, am I, do I have a black mark here? And, and what I have found is even Companies that have been successful with CD software, as an example, most people don't. Who are in this town, where we had 165 employees, don't even know what that was. That wasn't that long ago, 12 years. So uh, I think I've learned that a lot of the stigma that we make is of our own making. It's, it's right here. And that people who are in companies say, ah, I told you so, you dumbass. It's like, why are you listening to those people? Anyways, because again, you can pull someone from the street to tell you why something's not. Yes. Sounds like you went from a situation where you're telling a marketplace, here's what I'm selling, this is what you need, to listening to a marketplace, developing a solution to solve problems for what you saw out there. How did you go about talking to customers and people and understanding? Okay, I want to solve the problem. I don't want to just sell you the product. How did you make that transition? And where did that feedback come from? And how did you use it? That question make sense? Try me, try me again. Well, you went from you developed this product to your the agency model, which you right. uh, And then now you're one of the transitions I heard you say is that you started finding out where the customers are doing this. Right. How did you how did you identify that and really start to solve their problems as opposed to just providing the product? Yeah. How did we how did we derive that next layer of what they were saying about their problems? Yeah, which I think it sounds like you probably needed your relationships with them. Yeah. Well, I think what happened is as we were able to show people what was possible initially with geolocation in particular. They began to understand the ways that they were gathering information currently didn't, didn't any longer work for them, or that there were maybe new ways of doing that. So one of the things that, as a technologist, you, you sometimes do is you go through and you just slice your product feature or solution set and ask yourself, is, is this being underutilized? If we, if we did more or expose this in a certain way, does this lead to a new product group that might make sense? Um, but a lot of it is, you know, I think we go back to relationship selling as opposed to, you know, we refer to that as a model. If you can develop a relationship, and we did with some core agencies, they were very forthcoming with us about, they were less standoffish, less guarded about what their problems were, what their clients were asking for, because we didn't have direct access to the clients. They weren't very compliant about it. So I guess part of that is just experiential terms of, I've been in tech for almost 25 years now, so it's one of those things, just kind of the second nature. Bro? Can I add that? Uh, 
it's one of the things that happened too is that the agencies, the agency model, awaiting customers to ask them to call it. Okay. Which customers didn't know they needed it. Right. The agencies no longer take it to the attitude that I'm introducing you to the future by taking it. I think that's, uh, that's 